So hello and welcome everyone. This is Fuck You Pay Us. This is a weekly online symposium hosted by Rent Burden graduate students at UC Irvine in solidarity with the statewide UC cost of living COLA movement. My name is Molly Frailkill. I'm a third year PhD in visual studies here at Irvine. My co-facilitator Thomas Williams is a fifth year PhD in English. Um, we started this series in mid-April of this year um, and today is our 10th installment. Um, we also have some wonderful sort of speakers lined up going into the summer. So for more information to see recordings of our previous talks, um, please visit our website or contact us and I'll just drop our um, website address and our email address in the chat in just a moment. Um, I will also put a link to UCI for COLA, which is sort of the website for the COLA movement at Irvine. And also I will add a link to a timeline written by our comrades at UC Santa Cruz about the history of the COLA movement. So, um, and we will also sort of add that the format today is going to be a conversation um, and we'll sort of flow between sort of, uh, readings and questions that'll be posed by our moderator, Tomas Boko. But if you have any questions that you'd like to raise throughout the talk, um, please do send a message in the chat to Tom, Thomas Williams, who's a co-facilitator, um, and he will sort of go through the questions and feed them into the conversation. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, who will introduce our speaker. So we have fellow UCI graduate student, Samasa Boko. All right, uh, everyone, uh, this is going to be a riotous affair. Uh, so I just wanna hop straight into it. Um, I'll be introducing Dr. Frank Wilderson of University of California, Irvine, um, African-American studies, culture and theory, uh, and a uh, mentor of mine. I had heard of prison abolition on my hyper liberal arts campus of Pomona College as an undergraduate, but something different happened when I heard Frank Wilderson say in an interview, I'm not against police brutality, I'm against the police. That moment, immortalized in the infamous interview titled Irreconcilable Anti-Blackness and Police Brutality, held, which was held early in the era of Ferguson's uprising, represents a sea change in my intellectual and political development. I read a lot of books, but I also spend a lot of time listening to thinkers articulate their ideas in lectures and interviews. Frank's voice has become a familiar Sue sang lullaby to me. I know his auditory palate, the smooth belly laughs which emanate as of holding all the oxygen in the air hostage before reverberating in measured waves, the wry, sometimes sardonic jokes which precede those laughs, the sonic register of his voice, a voice which dispenses abstract critical theory with the same affable ease as when he recounts his idiosyncratic anecdotes about communist struggle in apartheid South Africa or working as a bouncer in Prince's nightclub back in the 70s, serve as an ironic bedrock for the often alarming conclusions he draws in his work. The following quotes and ideas come from that interview in Irreconcilable Anti-Blackness. When Wilderson said, quote, all black speech is always coerced speech because we live in a context of slavery. And quote, just because we're walking around in suits and ties and as professors does not mean we're not slaves, end quote. I gasp. When he casually stated, quote, policing blackness is not a form of discrimination, but a form of psychic health and well being for non black people end quote. I shuddered in horror and unconscious recognition. When he said, quote, professors are disqualified to make pronouncements on Black resistance, end quote, I knew his words had integrity. When he pointed out that not everyone needs to be an Afro-pessimist, but that, quote, we need Black people who know how to help other Black people get through the day to day, end quote. I knew his thoughts were attentive to care. When he ended that interview with, quote, 
What are they trying to do? They're trying to build a better world. What are we trying to do? We're trying to destroy it. Two irreconcilable projects, end quote. I fell out of my seat. That interview, which is a must listen, is emblematic of the stillness of Black being. This absence of movement goes beyond the reality of Black life to the truth of the Black position. A Black movement, political or otherwise, is an oxymoron. We are robbed of spatial and temporal coherence, meaning that we are barred from the Enlightenment narratives of bodily sovereignty and historical progression. Our bodies and our collective and individual strivings are rendered fiction. These truths of Black struggle exceed the diversity of Black desire. The following are lessons which I've learned from Frank. Black folk already know. As academics and public thinkers, our job is to validate Black people on the ground, to give them space to let their fantasies fly freely, to resist the university's charge to police and manage Black people's imaginations, to police and manage their anger and frustration, to refuse the terms of order and to slap away the questions, what is to be done? Or what comes next? Or how can we generalize Black struggle to the struggles of others? I learned how to stare unflinchingly at impossible problems and lay waste to the ruse of analogy. In order to learn how to dream, I first had to learn how to see properly. There's a scene in France Fanon's work where the colonized subject comes alive after fighting back and making the colonizer bleed. Frank's work made me come alive as I began to taste the blood that drips from the soup of material and ontological violence that I and all Black people wade through every single day, but had before then remained invisible to me. These questions sprouted. Why would I desire to be a master? Why would I desire to be recognized by my masters? Why would I want to write and think as if this Sisyphusian, eternal, unending Black struggle is somehow dignifying? I want this world to end now. And I have the reverence for myself and my people to have unreasonable expectations for the world. I stopped falling into the trap of telling non-Black people that Black liberation is something they want or something beneficial to them. To enter liberation, they must go through Blackness. And that means facing a terror way beyond falling, an anxiety far more dizzying than absolute freedom, a horror far beyond a monochromatic world, an exercise far more excessive than endless movement. If they ask me, I tell them, don't try to understand Black liberation. Shout out to Phyllis Jackson for what I'm about to say. Don't try to understand Black liberation. Respect it and fear it. These non-Black folk ain't responding to our discourse or our humanity. They're responding to our threat. And the power to pose the question is the greatest power of all. I introduce to you all Dr. Frank Wilderson uh, the third. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Samasa. I almost had to look behind me to see who you were talking about. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. And um, I just want to uh, co contextualize our relationship. Uh, and um, and the, and and give the readers, sorry, the viewers, some un understanding of of Phyllis Jackson, uh, whose name you shouted out. Um, uh, you have been a great, great help to me. I've learned so much from you in in seminars. Um, um, as pe many people 
in the audience know, but, but who are graduate students here, that in the culture and theory program, you're in sociology, but in the culture and theory program, you have to do a semester of, of really deep work on uh, Marxism, which means that you have to read uh, 532 pages of all of Das Kapital, the first volume of Marx's uh, big tome. And then you have to go into psychoanalysis in the, your second quarter. And so for the past two years, I have been teaching the uh, first module of those, of those, there's actually a three module first year course. Uh, I've been teaching the first module, Das Kapital, and uh, it's very difficult text, as most people know, um, to, to read. And even though I've read it twice before I began teaching it, it was a very difficult text for me to teach. You took it uh, the first year that I taught it, and uh, we're one of the, the many people in the classroom who really helped me in the discussion with exegesis, uh, imminent critique, and just communicating to people who are not prone to crit critical theory, your peers, uh, what was going on during the discussions. But not only that, uh, you came back the second year without even registering and took the whole class again. <laughs> you know, at that point, I was actually tempted to just go home and let you teach it for the whole <laughs> because you had, so I really appreciate your labors and, um, and what I've learned from you in the past. And you're going to be a tremendous uh, professor. You're already a tremendous intellectual. But your undergraduate teacher who you mentioned, uh, Professor Phyllis Jackson in the art history department, uh, many people don't know, many people know Phyllis Jackson uh, at Pomona College out in the desert as an art historian. And Phyllis and I were on stage uh, together at the Broad Museum for uh, the, a symposium that Bridget Cooks and I organized called Soul of a Nation. And she, Phyllis and I did one segment of that on, on stage. And one of the things that we figured out in doing the math of our, of our ages is that uh, when I was 14, she was probably 20, and she was one of the people running the Black Panther office uh, in, in Oakland and in, in Berkeley. When I was, under, when I was uh, in junior high school, I was going there all the time to get uh, books like The Wretched of the Earth and to do the after school school classes that they had. So it was very funny that, that uh, here's this Panther who's now a, a colleague and the professor of mine who was probably in those same rooms of those same teaching teachings uh, back in 1970 that I crossed paths with. And now we are both uh, knowing her star student in you. So I really appreciate this. And my hat's off to all the uh, COLA uh, activists who invited me today. I'm very, very happy about this. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of these symposiums, especially when you have my friends on in the next uh, few weeks, uh, Fred Moten and uh, Joy James. Uh, and I wanna say, so I'm gonna get right into reading about six pages from uh, my memoir slash uh, critical theory book. It's a hybrid, uh, what people are calling auto theory these days. And normally before I do these, I've been, I've been doing about three of these a week, if you can imagine. Uh, and normally I, I pick the passages that I'm going to read based upon um, you know, what I think about the audience or what I'd like to read this, this day. But um, it's you, Samasa, and your comrades, I should tell the audience, who actually picked these pages that I'm going to read today. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to read these. I actually will not give an introduction to these six pages uh, because the introduction is uh, in it, it. It's in the book itself. It's in the what I'm about to read. So let's get busy and uh, then we'll have some discussion. This is chapter six called Mind the Closing Doors. I was 33 in the summer of 1989 when I moved to New York City. Black, yes, but a Midwesterner from Minneapolis and a young black Minneapolitan is ominously younger than a young black New Yorker. Quite literally, New York blew my mind in a way my hometown never could. The seismic shift was mostly internal. I found my voice as a writer. I developed as a theorist too, which means I learned how to compare systems of thought, not just what was inside them. But the so-called Big Apple was expensive in both the cost of living 
and what it costs my soul. I came to see in New York things I had only read about or heard mentioned on the news, impulsive cruelties, straight, no chaser. Yet I knew when my studies were over that there'd be no way I could go back to Minneapolis. Even though I long, I, the longer I lived in New York City, the poorer I became. Moving from a swanky high rise on 96th and Riverside Drive to a flat I shared with two other, other graduate students in Harlem, to a ramshackle dwelling that the rats were kind enough to share with me in Washington Heights. I should pause for a moment and say that I, I have friends, uh, older friends in the audience, and uh, one of them reads along since her hearing is pretty hard. And so I'm going to go uh, to page 234 now. The, the day after the incident on the A train, it was an incident where a right wing white person from probably uh, Bensonhurst uh, kicked a Sikh man in the teeth as we were riding on the subway just a few days after George Herbert Washer, Walker Bush started bombing uh, Kuwait to get Saddam Hussein out. There was a lot of Islamophobia in New York um, at that time. The day after the incident on the A train, I sat in Professor Edward Said and Professor Jean Franco's cultural studies project class at Columbia. Said and Franco had chosen 25 students from an applicant pool of 100. Let me just see. From an applicant pool of 100, I was a novice at critical theory. And not for one moment did I believe I would be admitted. When I was told that the list of 100 had gone down from 50 people who would be asked for a writing sample and a personal interview with, with Franco and Said, I thought in my Minnesota way, the registrar had made a mistake. I would learn that Jean Franco had survived the 1944-54 CIA-driven Guatemalan coup d'etat that had deposed the democratically elected Guatemalan president, Jacobo Arbenz, and ended the Guatemalan revolution of 1944 to 1954. Her name had not always been Franco. She was British and had taken the name of her husband, a Guatemalan left-wing cabinet minister whom the CIA surrogates had killed in the coup. Not only was she a nimble-minded critical theorist, but she wrote fiction. And outside of the cultural studies project sessions, she and I spent several afternoons in her Upper West Side apartment, workshopping our, re our respective manuscripts. Before coming to Columbia, Franco had been the first professor of Latin American literature at the University of Essex in England. It was a prized opportunity for me to study under Edward Said as well a man I didn't even think I would meet when I came to Columbia. And, and doubly so because there were only two students in the class who were not in the comparative literature's PhD program. And I was one of them, a fiction writer, and not a PhD student in the comparative literature or philosophy departments from the other side of the quad. The other interloper was a Sri Lankan graduate student of international affairs who bore the blotchy skin of two bullet wounds in his neck. A Sri Lankan soldier had shot him as he covered the Tamil conflict in his country. But he had lived, somehow, and managed to escape to Zimbabwe, where the bullet wounds healed, and he lived under a false name for two years before he came to Colombia. Though I had read the works of Franz Fanon and studied existentialism at Dartmouth, my eight prior years as a stockbroker had nuked my brain cells. Wholly unprepared was I for the rigor, the breadth of theoretical reflection, and the level of abstraction at which Franco and Said conducted their seminars. The simple and, as I told a fiction professor, simple-minded literature courses we were required to take in the MFA program never scratched the surface of interpretation that I experienced in the cultural studies project just across the quad. We never discuss power or violence or the way a text labors in the school of the arts. We were there to see how fiction was made, not what fiction meant or whose lives it enhanced or how it greased the wheels of death for others. Edward Said was tall, urbane, and handsome. A concert pianist who, after the Nakba, was sent to boarding school 
where he met Omar Sharif, who he, whom he called a head boy and a bully. Until I met Saeed, I hadn't met a professor who took the stakes of his profession as seriously, even though I was surrounded by academics as a child. Later, I understood that this, that this was not some sort of shortcoming on the part of my parents or the black scholars who were their friends. If their scholarship had been as open about its implications for black liberation as Edward Said's was about the implications for the revolution in Palestine, they would have been killed long before they could rise, they could raise me. I wanna stop for a moment and, and ask Samasa, am I coming through okay? I'm just, okay, fine, I will continue. Edward Said was a public intellectual and a founder of the academic field of post-colonial studies. He came to class in what were surely $300 or $500 suits, an even grand if in addition to his tailored tweeds and handsome shirts, one considered the blended wool trench coats he wore in winter. He was a controversial member of the Palestinian National Congress, the legislative body of the PLO, because he publicly criticized Israel and Arab countries, especially the political and cultural policies of Muslim regimes that acted against the national interests of their peoples. And because, at least in class and during office hours, if not on every public stage on which he appeared, he was steadfast in his conviction that the state of Israel had no place in an ethical world. First Martin Luther King, then the Black Panthers, then France Fanon and the literature of Toni Morrison and Toni Ked Bambar had tutored me. Edward Said and his aphorisms came after all of that. He was far more important in my life than I was in his. When I met Said at the age of 33, I was primed intellectually for a great leap forward. And in the two short years that I knew him, my ability to explain relations of power did just that did just that. It grew by leaps and bounds. The Palestinian National Congress had been on the run, had been run out of Lebanon by the Israeli Defense Force. They set up shop in Tunis. After one of Saeed's trips to Tunis, I dropped by during office hours and told him of rumors I'd heard that he was on a hit list. This was nothing new. U.S. Zionists, he said, threatened to kill him all the time. But this was Abu Nidal's hit list. Abu Nidal, in addition to being commander of the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, was also a fellow parliamentarian on the Palestinian National Council, the government in exile. I sat at the end of the student queue outside Saeed's office, and when it was my turn, tried tricks Shahrazad would have envied to make the time with him last. I told Said that I had heard he and Nidal had argued in Tunis about whether or not the PLO's armed wing should target civilians. Said told Nidal that the PLO should not resort to bombing buses and killing people who were not conscripted by the Israeli Defense Force or the police. Nidal, was purported to have mocked Said's expensive threads and the safety of his life in New York, and to have reminded Said how difficult it was for an under-resourced guerrilla organization like the PFLP to get next to targets of a military nature. And finally, to have also reminded Said that the Israelis don't engage in this kind of hand-wringing when the lives of Palestinian civ civilians hang in the balance. The argument ended with my professor being added to Abu Nidal's hit list. It was late in the day and the corridors of Philosophy Hall were silent, not even the echo of dust. I was fortunate to have been the last student outside of his office behind a long haired taciturn music theory doctoral stu student who went in before me to discuss his dissertation on tonal harmony in light of Adorno's critique of tonality as an automatic system from which one must escape, but from which nobody can escape. He was gone now, and there were no more students in the corridor queue. 
It did not occur to me that Edward Said had a wife and children that he might want to get home to. And since he didn't throw me out after the customary 10 or 15 minutes, I stayed. I can't say with any certainty that he confirmed the story of his row with Abu Nidal. Whether it was true at all, or if the details amassed like a snowball rolling downhill as it moved among the graduate students, he never let on. He smiled obliquely as he spoke, as I spoke, with his elbows on his desk where dust flecked light fell on unmarked papers. He steepled his fingers and touched them to his lips. Then he said, Abu Nidal and I are not friends, but the fact that he might want to kill me does not mean we're antagonists. Edward Said placed his palms on his desk. He told me that unlike him and Abu Nidal, he and Yasser Arafat were in fact friends, that they sat together and talked for long hours and ate cornflakes drenched in orange juice in the old days in Beirut when the Israeli Defense Force laid siege to the city and cut off its supply of milk. They were lifelong friends. They were also political antagonists. Nidal and I don't have a substantive disagreement, although, Said said with a chuckle, my death at his hands would be substantive from my perspective. On the other hand, Yasser Arafat and I have a substantive disagreement. Nidal and I want the same thing the dismantling of the state of Israel, not just the two-state solution, although that might have to be the first step, and in its place, the establishment of a secular and economically ethical state, neither a caliphate nor a Jewish state, but a country where ethnic identity and religion play no part in the distribution of wealth and political capital. Nidal and I share a strategic orientation. We both have what's known as strategic rigidity. Saeed stressed the importance of knowing the difference between strategy and tactics. His view was that yes, armed struggle was necessary in order to bring the Israeli state to an end. No nation has fallen by plebiscite, he noted. But killing civilians at this point in the struggle was tactically ill-advised and would hurt his efforts in the West. While he, Saeed, was tactically engaged in counter-hegemonic struggles, appearances on liberal news programs, speaking at massive teach-ins on university campuses, lobbying US politicians, submitting editorials to the New York Times. In other words, while he was in the West engaging in a Gramscian war of position to win the hearts and minds of liberals, it would be counterproductive to the Palestinian cause if Abu Nidal was bombing Israeli school buses. What exists, Frank, he said, is a fierce disagreement, granted, but not one which is of political, which is to say strategic significance. It's a heated debate about tactics. He brought Yasser Arafat back into our conversation. Arafat, Saeed declared, didn't know the meaning of strategic rigidity. In other words, Arafat did not have a vision of what absolute liberation for Palestinians meant. And so he would be satisfied with a squatter camp on the border of Israel as long as we had our own flag. Nidal and Saeed, Saeed said, were tactically flexible and strategically rigid. Arafat, in stark contrast to Nidal and Said, it was explained to me, was strategically flexible and tactically flexible as well. What this said to me was that their violent dis disagreement notwithstanding, Said and Nidal were revolutionaries, whereas Arafat was, at the end of the day, a bourgeois reformer. I was learning something about the precise nature of language in the service of critical theory and revolutionary praxis. I had always used antagonism colloquially, 
but I hadn't known that I, I hadn't known that I was doing so. Therefore, it never occurred to me that just because an interlocutor wanted to kill you, it did not mean that your relationship with that person was antagonistic. The lesson I learned at dusk in Edward Said's office would see me through the harrowing moments of internecine violence months later when I finished my MFA at Columbia and left New York and moved to South Africa and joined the African National Congress. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Frank. Uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, your readings are just lyrical verses to my ears. Um, so I've heard and read at least 97.1% of your work. And so far, at least on your current book tour, no one has asked you to read this portion of the book. Uh, so I wanted to ask, how did this scene change how you understand conflicts within social movements? And uh, as an addendum, can you talk about uh, some of the work you did in grad school and the story about the UAW? And you know <laughs> what story I'm talking about. <laughs> ah, does the word, does the phrase set up mean anything to you? <laughs> <laughs> I see your I see your comrades laughing and stuff. You know, <laughs> it reminds this. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of 1970 when I think uh, Bobby Seale and some other people were on trial uh, out in New Haven, uh, and uh, the Panthers went to Paris to uh, ask uh, Jean Genet, the playwright, to come and and speak at a rally to raise money for the liberation and stuff like that. You know, and so uh, the the State Department wouldn't give Genet a. a, a, a a, pa um, a visa to get in the country. So the Panthers snuck him through the Canadian border over, over land. And uh, he, uh, he rocked up at this rally and he began reading this very you know, complicated uh, French intervention uh, about suffering and all this. And there was a graduate student like y'all <laughs> standing next to him who was translating this, you know, um, someone that had worked with the Panthers, they realized that this was not going to rile the crowd up, you know. So he just, every time Janet would say something, he, he would just translate, and he's saying, off the pigs and take this country down, you know. <laughs> and then, and then like, later somebody walked up to Janet and said, uh, I speak very fluent French, man, and, and that, that revolutionary graduate student actually didn't translate what you were saying, you know? And Jade said, well, what did he say? He said, he said, off the pigs and all power to the people. And, you know, and Jade says, oh, that's all right. That's, that's, as, that's as good as anything else, you know? So um, let's start backwards. Um, it's very, it's funny, but it's sad that uh, 21 years ago at UC Berkeley, uh, when I was a graduate student about 40, four years old, 43 years old, uh, we were in the same place. The, um, except a little bit worse, but maybe not. In other words, we were not, it had not been recognized, the teaching assistants in the UC system not been recognized uh, at all as a collective bargaining unit. And as we were moving towards, we were trying to just get a contract on the books uh, and there were about five people elected from every campus to be the official bargainers for this new thing that was going to happen, which is called recognition as a collective bargaining unit. And I was elected as one of the people from um, a UC Berkeley. Um, and there was interesting splits and divisions, as there always are, internal to the graduate revolutionary, or if you could just say labor relations movement. And what we found was that the most radicalized part of the uh, TAs were coming from the humanities and the social sciences. And we figured that this, that we did not just want a contract to be recognized by the university, we actually wanted to have this contract recognize our rights as sentient beings who deserve to live well. And we had a whistleblower's clause in our contract, 
which would not allow the university to retaliate against whistleblowers. We had all kinds of clauses about what were the tools of our labor and how the university as an institution had to pay for those tools. We had uh, LGBT and, and, and racial discrimination clauses, anti-discrimination anti clauses in that. And we had a right to strike clause in there. And you know that for many years uh, since, since uh, well, you might not know, but since January, 1981, when uh, Ronald Reagan unilaterally fired all the air traffic controllers in one day, that was the beginning of the end of, of, of the breaking of the backs of labor unions in this country and their right to strike. He simply fired all the air traffic controllers and hired a bunch of scabs, and that's what we have today. And the unions went along with that. And so our parent, your parent, the UAW, actually uh, was more interested, I, I'm sure they've reformed by now, right? <laughs> I'm sure they're completely different. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that now they're down revolutionaries, you know? <laughs> but I can only speak from my experience, okay? <laughs> uh, 20 years, 21 years ago, they were just a bunch of sheepdogs for the consensus, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, what they told us is that uh, we needed to get recognized so that they could get their dues being paid to them from this so many, I don't know how many 10,000 graduate student teaching assistants across the UCs. And they did not want us to fight for a right to strike clause. They did not want us to fight for a, a whistleblower retaliation uh, uh, clause. They did not want us to fight for LGBT and, and the rights of, of people of color. They did not want us to fight for um, substantial daycare programs for graduate students with parents. They just want a goddamn contract and get it signed and get out the door. So in point of fact, uh, what we ended up having was basically two adversaries. One was the administration and the other were the people that were supposed to be our parents, the UAW. Um, the, there were, as in any, you know, when you take a, a system like the University of California with nine campuses and 30 some thousand people almost on each campus, you're going to have divisions from each collective bargaining unit. And so we did not have unity amongst ourselves to tell the UAW that we don't work for you, you work for us. Um, and so the final negotiating session, um, there were a lot of activists on the ground at UC Berkeley. Uh, Professor Sarah Kaplan at San Diego, uh, University, of San Di University of California, San Diego. Professor uh, Jarrett Sexton here at UC Irvine. And they were, they were my constituents, right? They were pushing me to not tom out, as we say, in this, uh, in this uh, negotiation. And so it was incumbent upon me to uh, push the collective bargaining units to negotiate for a very strong contract, regardless of the fact that striking had been, the, the backs of unions had been broken by Reagan. We weren't gonna go for that. So in the long run, um, the final session was held at, uh, at, a, at a resort, a state park somewhere near Monterey. And uh, I received uh, a letter from the UAW attorneys a cease and desist letters uh, kicking me off of the negotiating committee for UC, for the UC Berkeley contingent. Uh, and I basically responded by saying, my answer is, you know, pick a finger. If you can, uh, if you can guess what finger I'm talking about. So here's a hint, it's not that finger. <laughs> I see you all getting the, you, yeah, you all know what finger it is, okay? <laughs> And so, so I'm glad you're laughing because they didn't think it was funny, okay? And so, <laughs> um, so it, it was, they made the location so secret that they told all the people on all the campuses who had been elected to the collective bargaining not to tell me or not to tell any of the so-called radical contingent at UC Berkeley where this meeting was gonna happen. Um, somehow I found out and I got in my little Honda Civic uh, and tooled down the coast and rocked up, took my rightful elected place at the table. Across the table was the UC administration just smirking, you know, and the union boss from Detroit got up 
asked the administrators to leave. Uh, and then she called the cops. And, you know, the cops came in and they were, it was like click, 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 uh, handcuffed me, arrested me. And that was the end of that. And now, you know, that's the, the Berkeley masses lost. Uh, you all lost system wide, and now you had a shitty contract, and you're back to square one from 21 years ago. What was your other question? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that was a pretty good uh, answer. You got at everything I wanted to get at. Uh, what I want to say is that I, I don't think it's a coincidence, you know, that this wave of graduate student activism. Uh, has flared up um, preceding, but also in conjunction with the wave of strikes all across the country um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the sorts of activism and movements that we've seen emerge. And now this, um, I want us to talk about what's what's really going on right now with the, the movement for Black Lives. Um, and uh, what I really wanna ask because I see a lot of people saying, wow, isn't it so nice, so great that so many people are out in the streets supporting Black people and Black life. And I don't want to be the party pooper, but um, what I think we should be asking is not what does it mean that so many people are showing this symbolic support for Black lives, but rather how has the Black radical tradition been re-articulated and what has been lost for that to happen. I mean, when we've got Obama supporting the protests and he called the, uh, you know, black young folk in Ferguson and Baltimore thugs, uh, when we've got the New York Times releasing the 1619 Project, which is essentially all about how Black pain and struggle somehow makes democracy in the United States better. Uh, when we've got people turning to Black capitalism and talking about buy Black, or even worse, vote for Biden. Um, you know, it, it, it makes me think, you know, that I think people don't always realize that the civil rights movement was not a mass movement. It, it was not a movement that everybody was on board with, even within the black community. You know, most of our grandparents, if they say they was out there, a lot of them are lying. And I know the worst thing I can do as a black youth is say that the elders are lying, but they are. Uh, the archives show it, um, you know, and that voting, black capitalism, these other forms were never supposed to be an end or a given they were simply organizing tools, uh, but that instead they have now become uh, sort of anti-Black disciplining mechanisms. So I wanted to hear your thoughts. I, I large measure, you've, you've given me my thoughts as you, as you do in class, <laughs> I mean, I think, <laughs> for which I'm grateful. <laughs> we can move on. No, I'm joking. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say something. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, let's let's get down to brass tacks here. We did not come here as degraded humans. That was not our position in the paradigm diachronically as the paradigm evolved. That was the position of Native Americans, a degraded form of humanity. That was the position of the Irish, the position of, of Jews, later the position of Latinx people. We existed materially, and we still exist both materially and psychically as cargo, as implements for and extensions of the master's prerogative. The theoretical takeaway from that is that there's never a conversation between black formations and the and civil society the the the, mo the modality of oppression between black people and civil society is not the modality of exclusion of 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 or of of truncated forms of recognition and incorporation it's the modality of murder 
That is the operative modality. It's not the, the other oppressed people exist at a metacritical level through a modality of exploitation and alienation. They have possessions in terms of labor time, uh, immaterial possessions, and they have uh, possessions, temporal possessions in terms of, of language and culture, and they have, they have material possessions in terms of land, which have been, which, from which they have been alienated by colonial oppression. Whatever possessions we may think that we have, these have never been recognized and incorporated within either the, the libidinal economy, which is the collective unconscious, or the political economy of civil society in the United States or, or anywhere else. So what we have to understand is that um, the world is responding right now in mass ways, but they're not responding to, uh, to the conceptual articulation of a black demand. They're responding to the fear of black bodies and the fear of black movement, okay? And so the Obamas, the Bidens, um, the the um, the you, so so the Obamas and the and the professional Negro class, as I as I call them, I mean their 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 job as they are also implements, right? They're black implements of a hegem of a hegemony of other people, and they are and they are instrumental as implements. They are instrumentalized not to help us through a path of total liberation. They're instrumentalized to manage black anger. That's their goal, that's their goal. And so there's no, there's no I mean, there's a, there's a rhetorical contradiction, as you pointed out, between uh, an Obama in 2014 calling the uprising in, uh, in, in Ferguson thugs and Obama in 2020 celebrating it, but there's actually no paradigmatic contradiction because in both cases, he's doing his job as a manager of black revolt. Why does, why does the tune change? And it seems to be different because right now, shit is for real, you know? It's, it's it, black rage is spreading exponentially. So in other words, we're at a point where containment still needs to happen, but it can only happen, like in 14, it could happen through the deployment of more police force. Now it has to happen through co-optation and, uh, and changing the narrative and changing um, the, 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 the goals. As black revolutionaries, we have to resist that and develop cognitive maps that are not seduced by the progress narratives that the black bourgeoisie has been deployed to impose upon us. We also have to not be seduced by the discourse of moral judgment. In other words, the discourse of moral judgment, which, which, is, which, which, which is resonant with questions of guilt or innocence. The discourse of moral judgment, which is resonant with the, 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 the rhetorical narratives that you hear about, not all police are bad. Uh, there's, there's good cops and bad cops. We have to be resistant um, to the, the, the moral, the, 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 economy, the economy of moral judgment, um, which calls for police reform. And we have to shift our psychic lens to a cognitive map that understands that policing is vertically integrated in black life. It is not, it is not a matter of the practice it is, it, is, it is the, we live, in a, we live, whether it's you as a grad student or me as a professor or me as a prisoner, wherever we are, we live in a carceral continuum. We are, we are, we are incarcerated just as we were during slavery. And that policing of black bodies is not something 
that can be reformed. The policing of other kinds of bodies can be reformed. Why? Because they are recognized as at various levels of, 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 of the scale at, of, at, at variously valued humans. We are cognitively and paradigmatically positioned as the sentient beings against which humans come to understand themselves as, as, as having uh, a, a, a metaphysical presence and an ontological reality. We, so in other words, what I'm trying to say, and these, and as you know, but other people might not know, these points have been made in books by Cydia Hartman, Jared Sexton, um, Hortense Spillers, um, David Merritt, and myself, is that policing is not, policing the black body is not something that can be reformed performatively because anti-black violence is necessary to the production of human self-making. I'm gonna give one example of this before I, before I close. Um, if you look at um, declassified documents uh, from the CIA, the FBI, and um, intelligence, uh, community, uh, intelligence components of local police states, uh, stations, what you, what you find is an uh, overarching anxiety about Black activists, uh, Black writers, uh, and, and Black resistance. And the anxiety about Black resistance is 10 times larger than the actual material effect of Black resistance on the state. That's number one. So in other words, to put it simply, but hopefully not too simplistically, the fear of a Black planet is larger than life itself. So Black people, Native people, Jewish people, um, Latinx people enter into a white space and they might produce a kind of psychic anxiety in what we call primary forms of primary processes of signification in, in parts of the, of, the, of the unconscious. But it's easy for that anxiety to be concretized through secondary forms of, of signification in the pre-conscious and conscious mind because you could look at that person if you're white and say, ah, this is the demand that they embody. The brown person embodies the demand of the return of all of the Southwestern United States and California. Even though we're not gonna give it to them, we're gonna kill them, make a border wall, this is the demand that they embody. Uh, the red native person embodies the demand that the entire Western hemisphere be returned to them. You see what's happening here? A concrete conceptual coherence of the threat moves the anxiety from phobia to concretize conceptual fear. But when the black enters, the psyche is burdened with what we call negrophobogenesis, which is to say, here is the embodiment of a demand for which you can never write a sentence as to what would redress the suffering. That produces a tremendous threat to the psyche but it is also necessary because it's the very fact that the black embodies a demand that can never be righted, which makes the black the foil of all other forms of humanity with demands that can be righted, which gives human civil society its, co its coherence. So what happens is that all of these declassified documents show that there's a tremendous amount of covert government sanctioned uh, actions against black people, ordinary black people, as well as black activists, a tremendous amount of money, pow firepower, homicidal gestures and trajectories are put into this, but nowhere is there an understanding on the part of our assailants as to what it is they think we want. Because if you drop a stone into the well of black suffering, you will never hear it hit the water. And this is, and, and this is, this terrifies not just the state, but it terrifies the black political class because what it means is that their job is to manage a rage that would otherwise proliferate exponentially to get what was taken from us, which is everything from material wealth 
to our cosmological being. Did I get to what you were asking? Yes. <laughs> yes, you did uh, in your classical style. Um, and I want to think more about this idea of redress um, and think about the, the sort of way Black demands are being articulated in this moment. So Jared Sexton has an essay he wrote several years back uh, where he essentially is asking or he's interrogating the call for Black lives to matter and what that means. And he says there's a conundrum that you have this way in which Black um, cisgendered male bodies who die at the hands of police um, are put at the forefront of these movements um, to the, the detriment of remembrance and struggle for um, the death of Black women, um, like Breonna Taylor, or Black trans folk, like Nina Pop um, and Tony McDade. And so what Jared asks is, what does it mean to ask for Black lives to matter? And what is lost in the instance of that utterance? And my uh, sort of thinking there is that it's because Black lives matter is the answer to a racist question. Just like Zakia Iman Jackson says of Black excellence. And that by falling into the grammar of this racist and anti-Black desire for recognition, value, and incorporation, as if that is somehow going to heal the wounds of our historical trauma, uh, results in a focus on Black cisgender, cisgendered men in the same way that any hierarchy of value is going to be inflected um, along the lines of race, class, and gender um, in this sort of anti-Black matrix. Um, and what do you make of that? Well, that is right. Uh, I know you want me to say more. I mean, it's, it's really, as, as I was listening to that, I was just thinking anecdotally about, uh, you know, how, obscene it is from an intra-Black perspective that you have this massive movement called Black Lives Matter that was literally started and mobilized and staffed by uh, uh, Black women, Black lesbian women, and Black non-gender conforming people on behalf of the murders of Black cisgendered men. And yet, that kind of mobilization, which can happen rapidly and, and, and easily, um, from the people who started it, when they are attacked and murdered, then we can't do the same. And it's and it really, it, you know, just to make it simple without being simplistic, it is our desire to um, be part of uh, heteronormative nuclear families that could be recognized and incorporated as heteronormative nuclear families by everyone else, which doesn't make any sense at all. Because in, or in order for that to happen, something, in order to, to have mommy, daddy, baby, and then the, the narrative is that in the domestic sphere, that is a sphere of sanctuary, which the state, you know, if any Gramscian knows, the state understands that it doesn't cross those boundaries with impunity. You know, in order for Black people to actually inculcate that and think that they could be part of that, that they could actually, number one, have gender. Number two, be recognized as, as gendered. Number three, be recognized through a, a, syst a, 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 a hierarchical system of, of gender differentiation such, such that the laws and powers 
of patriarchy can apply to a black man just the way they can to a man who is white or not black, in order for that to happen, you would have to say that something essential changed in 1865. Because up until that point, we were just cargo and implements and objects for, for, for sale. I mean, so in other words, it's, 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 it's not just that it's wrong because uh, it uh, does not recognize the suffering and the homicidal experience of death that transgender people have and non-gender conforming people have who are black, but it's also suggesting that we as black cisgendered men um, and black heteronormative women live in a world that is something other than what Sexton calls borrowed institutionality. There's no such thing as a black family. There's no such thing as a black father. There's no such thing as a black son, a black mother, a black daughter. At some point in the, in the, in the mind, one gives oneself a kind of shorthand that I exist in that way, but you do not position yourself in a paradigm. The paradigm positions you. And there has never been a moment, be it diachronically, throughout history or synchronically in the arrangement of power in which the paradigm has recognized in any essential way the human status or the filial power and sanctuary of black people. So for us to, for us to think that that exists now is to one, fool ourselves that we have somehow transitioned from thingness to personhood and it is also to impose a kind of double suffering on people in our spaces. I won't use the word community unless I use it in, because there is no such thing as a slave community. There's a collection of objects waiting to be bought and sold, right? But community in, in, in quotation marks, it's, 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 it's to assume that somehow there is uh, not just um, uh, moral stability and, uh, and filial sanctuary for Black families, uh, but that we're recognized as such by the rest of the world. That is not true. There's, there's, there's nothing, and we, we can actually look at, at the laws to show that that is not true. There is the Street Terrorism Enforcement and Protection Act of 1988, which says that um, the, the California State Legislature imagined houses and apartments and dwellings in, in South Central LA as slave quarters and wrote a law that said that um, if someone commits a crime at some, in some other part of the city and you come back to their house and you see a photo album with them, with other people in that house, that those people can be prosecuted as supplemental perps and the house itself can be designated as a crime scene, even though it takes place miles away from the scene of the so-called crime. And our sociologists, I'm not going to diss on sociologists because I know that I know that that's that's your thing, man. But I'm just I'm just gonna this is you know a sociologist or or, or a legal scholar will will want to point to the empirical um, um, the empirical reality of that law, which is to say that well that law is on the books, Frank, but um, only one person has been prosecuted, which is Gloria Williams, whose son was supposed to have committed rape and they got back to South Central LA and they found her in a photo album with her son and they arrested her and she did 18 months in prison and they sold all this stuff in the apartment. The fact that it has only been prosecuted once is not the problem. The problem is that the California legislature had the fantasy of us as things, as implements and objects of exchange, not as subjects of exchange, as objects of exchange, which is the same psychic orientation that the slave master had to us years ago. It's a phobic fantasy 
it's a bigoted fantasy, but if you have a fantasy and you can subtend your fantasy, which is to say connect it like triangles at a right angle, if you can connect that fantasy with three million people in uniform, with hundreds of thousands of police on the street, with a military and the atomic bomb, then you can make all of your fantasies law. They can have objective value in the words of David Marriott. And so what we have is that all the phantasmagoric projections onto us as objects of exchange and accumulation are actually real, not because we think that, but because it organizes our life. It organizes our life. We live in prison, whether we are behind bars or in Beverly Hills. So uh, I like that you ended with that. We live in prisons, whether we're behind bars or Beverly Hills, whether we're in the academy or on the streets, which is of course not to say we all experience you know, the same thing, but the sort of carceral continuum that you speak of, we all have to contend with. And what we do have is never guaranteed. Uh, as black people. Um, what I want to get some of your expertise on because, you know, you're trained in film and rhetoric. So I want to get your take on this concept of copaganda uh, or cop propaganda, um, which has come back into the, the popular discourse right now. Um, for example, the show Cops, uh, which I just learned was created to fuel the war on drugs um, in the 80s, just got canceled after 30 some odd years. Um, and I just learned that in Hollywood, I already knew that the military uh, will read scripts of Hollywood productions uh, and approve or disapprove of whether they go out. But even the LAPD has had that power um, to approve or disapprove of Hollywood scripts and their portrayal of cops. So can you talk about, uh, on a psychoanalytic level, what is propaganda? What does it do to us as a population and how does it work? I returned from South Africa in uh, 1996. I had been there for six weeks in 1989 after winning a literary award, which allowed me to travel there to supposedly write a novel. Uh, then I returned again in for six weeks in 1990. And then I moved there in uh, 1991 and stayed there until the end of 1996. And many people think of that this period as the peaceful period of, to, of, to trans, to trans, uh, to, of transition to democracy. In point of fact, there were something like 21,000 political murders motivated by the state from 1948 to 1994, and 14,000 of those 21,000 murders happened in the period from 89 to 90 to 94 while, while, while I was there. So I actually saw some of the most horrific forms of anti-Black violence uh, in the schools where I taught in Soweto, as well as uh, in uh, the urban center of, of Johannesburg. Um, I thought I'd seen it all. But I came back and began teaching uh, as a substitute teacher for the school year. Uh, in the, uh, I think I started at the end of 96, around November as a substitute teacher of the Compton Unified School District. And I saw more horrific forms of anti-Black policing of the children in the middle schools, the high schools, uh, even, and even the elementary schools in Compton than I had seen in Soweto. So I want that to just sink into the audience for, for a moment, that the, that, the, that the level of policing against uh, black kids under the age of, of, of 18 was more systemic 
in Compton than it was in in Soweto. I saw I saw um, a, a scrum of cops, for example, waiting outside of junior high schools, like half a block away, waiting to capture children who were going to be one to five minutes late, and handcuffing them uh, and bringing them down for truancy to be to be to be. It wasn't that they were going to be held overnight. It was to be fingerprinted and photographed. I saw boys uh, uh, and sometimes girls as well being lined up against walls and like, what's going on here? And uh, they would be turned around to face and they, their, their pol pol Polaroid cameras would be taking their pictures and they'd be fingerprinted on, on mobile fingerprinting, you know, right there. So in other words, what I was seeing was the coercive armed data collection of black youth on a scale in South Central LA that I had not seen in Soweto. That's number one. Um, ratchet up the scale of abstraction to the black bourgeoisie. And what you find is that um, for the past 101 years, uh, the FBI has been uh, running a sub agency, which is perhaps the largest and most sophisticated African American literature department in the world, in which they have been uh, collecting black poetry, black creative nonfiction, and black fiction in manuscript form as well as in published book form for 101 years. Okay? They have been analyzing this, and these are these are you know the CIA likes to think of the FBI as a bunch of uh, lowbrow Irish dudes uh, from Bensonhurst who got their law degree at Fordham and wear polyester suits and don't know nothing. Okay, Hoover taught the F, uh, taught the CIA how, how how to do this, and and you can read all about this in my friend uh, William Maxwell's book F FBI's. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that they do is they very sophisticatedly uh, read for what is going to happen in the Black world. Let me put it like this. If you look at the artwork of an oppressed people and you do a symptomatic reading of it, in other words, if you, if you do a psychoanalytic reading of the text for the symptoms of, of, it, of, the, of, of, of collective trauma and for the symptoms of the dreams to get out of that trauma, you can actually treat a, not just one book, one novel, but a collection of books and poetry in any one period. You can, if you read that work psychoanalytically, you can actually develop what is called a, 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 an understanding of leading indi indicators. In other words, you can scenarialize and model a theory about what these people are going to do in the world three years out, five years out, 10 years out. And so by reading, for example, by, by the FBI doing analysis on uh, the novel, uh, The Man Who Cried I Am, who is not part of any movement, he's a journalist, black guy, went to Spain in about 1964 and just wrote this book, right? And what they could, what they could do from a book like that is figure out that at some point in time, something's going to kick off very soon, like the Black Panthers, okay? So they have been... In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the kids on the street in Compton are policed in their bodies just for being. Not, not even, we're not even talking about the rot gut murder. We're talking about the collection of data on a population, bless you, on a, on a population for whom the population presents a problem to civil society and civil society cannot figure out what the demand is, right? Because the demand is endless. And they're also doing that with the intellectual work. And the, this, this uh, group of FBI agents have been uh, keeping a revolving list of writers on what they call preventive detention, who would be, who would be uh, candidates for preventive detention should there be massive uprisings. They have got so skilled at this that they actually began to write in blackface. They began to write poetry and short stories in black vernacular. They began to put out what's called in the in in uh, uh, in counterintelligence work 
false flags, which is to say the creation of journals, which are really fronts for the capture of material that they can then analyze. And um, so this is, this is, this is all part of what you're talking about. It's a, it's a, it's a co comprehensive carceral continuum that no other race of people in this country or in the world are subjected to in that way. Amazing, amazing to learn where our good old tax dollars go to uh, <laughs> in this country. Um, so I wanna give a, a heads up to folks. What we're gonna do is I've got one more question for Frank. Um, and then after that, we're going to take a five minute pause. And if you've got to go, you know, head out. Don't forget that this is being recorded and you can come back to it later. Um, but when we come back after that five minute break, um, we'll answer some questions um, and go on a little bit more. Um, so just a heads up on that. So the last question I'll ask is in thinking about. Um, the moment that we find ourselves in right now in this, you know, if we want to call it the movement for Black Lives or something else, um, how do we not fall into the trap of, say, a call like Black Lives Matter or calls like um, for Black excellent, uh, excellence? How do we shift the terms or refuse the terms of the entire order of political conversation, of the order of value. And um, can you talk about how the Black Liberation Army uh, presents sort of a, a, not a blueprint, but how they were able to do so in their own time? Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I know we're moving up against break time, so I'll try to be uh, brief this time. Uh, I want to circle back to what I said earlier about moral judgment, an economy of moral judgment. I don't have a tactical answer to your question. In other words, here's what you do step by step in the morning, OK? Uh, what the, because there are people on the ground who are working, burning down police stations, organizing, doing the necessary work. And, and Afro-pessimism is an ear trumpet to the sounds of Black rage and the proliferation of an iconoclastic Black revolt. It is, it is not a kind of praxis-oriented set of prescriptions. It would be, uh, I would be remiss if I were to offer that um, because that's not what I, that's not what we're about. However, what, to get to where you're talking about, Afro-pessimism has something to offer with respect to the means of approach, which is to say it has something to offer with respect to how do you develop, what are the touchstones of cohesion that will allow you to develop a cognitive map of the dynamics of oppression that do not fall into the trap of upward mobility and access to civil society and the reform of civil society, nor does it fall into the trap of thinking that a Marxist revolution that changes the dynamics in political economy so that no one can accumulate surplus value and wealth is distributed evenly, that that will somehow mitigate black, black, uh, militate black suffering, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if we're getting, we're getting bombarded uh, as black academics, you as black graduate students, we're, be, we're being bombarded with uh, the discourse of a moral economy to make us say things like you shouldn't burn down your own neighborhood or to make us say things like um, 
we need to make the police understand. I just got done telling you for the past, I don't know how many minutes, that there's no understanding with respect to the police. I mean, you know, it's, it's organically anti-Black. It's not, it's not performatively anti-Black. It's organically anti-Black. In the 1600s, so we have to, we have to develop, to, to get to what you're talking about, we have to develop a cognitive map of ethical assessment and throw out the cognitive map, the Judeo-Christian cognitive map, and it, of all monotheism, right? Whether it's Islam, uh, Judeo-Christian, or, or Judaism, or, or liberal humanist secularism, you know, which is to say something to the effect, which says something to the effect that civil society operates through elasticity or, re, or rigidity in various moments in history, and our job as activists is to push for its elasticity so that more people can be in included. No, civil society, whether it's elastic and liberal under an FDR or a Jimmy Carter president, or whether it's rigid and narrow under Ronald Reagan or Donald Trump president, civil society means something different to all kinds of people except black people. Civil society, regardless of its elasticity or rigidity, is always a murderous juggernaut against Black people. In other words, we're now not going to be captured by the ensemble of questions that come from a psyche that says civil society has a right to exist. In fact, our job then is, as, as revolutionary intellectuals is to turn the imperative back on the interlocutor and say to the interlocutor, prove to me diachronically, which is to say, prove to me through the historical genealogy of where we are, and then prove to me synchronically, which is to say, prove to me through an analysis like a Polaroid snapshot of the arrangement of power and the powers of life and death, you prove to me that from the Black position, there is something ethical about this world. They can't do it. They can't do it. What you get is apoplectic, sentimental gesturing after that, which is say, well, it's the only world, it's the only country we have, or well, what are you going to do? Ah, I didn't ask you that. Or, or I don't know what, you know, I don't care how you feel. I'm asking you to prove to me diachronically and synchronically, not through a moral economy of moral judgment, because once you get into an economy of moral judgment, then you cannot interrogate the status of the world itself. You can only interrogate the performance of various actors in the world. And since what blackness is, is the embodiment of a cosmological as well as corporeal destruction, which goes 1300 years back from the Arab slave trade to the Portuguese to today, it's imperative of you, my interlocutor, to first prove to me that it is ethical for me to have to enter into a moral economy of judgment before I answer your question. And once we are strong enough in our own minds with this cognitive politics of refusal, then the tactics will evolve from that themselves. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, so now uh, we'll have a, a five minute break. Uh, go get you a bite to eat, fix some tea, do what you need to do. Uh, and we'll be back to answer uh, some questions. Go ahead and get started um, Masa. with the questions. So I've kind of Masa. tried to take a look at some of the questions and kind of fold them together. Um, so uh, Frank, in this first, uh, sort of ensemble. Um, some people uh, are still having trouble with accepting Afro-pessimism as an analytic or theoretical tool. Um, and their misgivings 
come from both Black and non-Black positions. Um, some are asking uh, why it's necessary to sidestep morality. Um, some are questioning, uh, some have like a meta question. Um, why is it so difficult for non-Black people uh, to accept the singular nature of Black suffering, which I think folds very well into uh, the question of why we need to sidestep morality. So let's start there. Uh, well, um, I, I want to segue into that by, with um, something, and I want you to help me with a little call and response, uh, Samasa, when, when we go through this, if you would. Um, when we, before we went to the break, I, I said that uh, the most important thing was to develop a cognitive, cognitive map, which was based on ethical assessment as opposed to moral judgment. Uh, I did not say uh, sidestep morality. Uh, you know, it's, it's impossible to do. You're going to have your own morals uh, with respect to your own interpersonal relations, no, ma no matter what. Uh, but what I, what I was saying is that there is a kind of shaming discourse that is, that is imposed on mainly Black youth in revolt. And what there should be instead was a kind of symptomatic listening device, which I think Afro-pessimism is, which recognizes that, the, that world making, the process of world making, the process of creating sentient beings who will be called humans is inextricably bound with the destruction of, of, of black bodies. So that was, that was part of it. And, and I think that if you, if you, you know, if you're, if you're having a question about this, you don't believe me, of course, you're not going to rush out tomorrow and, and, and do this. I wouldn't want you to, you have to make it your own. But what you could do is to ask yourself um, these like four questions, which are actually not mine. Uh, they come from the, uh, the linguists and anarchist syndicalist Noam Chomsky, who says, you know, why are we in this framework of a moral economy, the economy of moral judgment, when thinking about political struggle and how does it hamstring us? And I think there are about four points, four points that happen that you as graduate students and me as a professor and anyone who is interested in doing critical work on the process should be thinking about. And people can write, I'm going to say it very slowly so you can write it down. One, the selection of topics. Two, the distribution of concerns. Three, the weighting and emphasis of issues. And four, the bounding of debate within acceptable limits. Those, those are the selection of topics, the distribution of concerns, the weighting and emphasis, weighting, like weighting and emphasis of issues and the bounding of debate within acceptable limits. That is, that is what happens to us day in and day out. We enter into a framework which has these things already, the, the topics have been selected. The distribution of concerns are already there from, from the media to the church, to schooling, to the family. The weighting and emphasis of these issues is already there. And then debate is bound within acceptable limits. And one of the things that, that binds debate, bounds debate within acceptable limits is the notion that there's something sacred and eternal about the country in which you, in which you now live that it's sacred and eternal. And those, all those things have to be questioned. And once you, begin to, once you begin to question those things, you begin to see how that 
all those things that I said have hamstrung you into a moral economy and not allowed you to think expansively with respect to ethical assessment, ethical assessment being where's the power, who has it, and how is it being deployed, and, is, and does this power have a right to exist? And so um, I think that's, that's, that's the uh, most besetting hobble of morality, not that you would become an amoral person, I'm not saying that at all, but to say that with political struggle, moral, the economy of moral judgment limits the horizon of your emancipatory trajectory. Uh, Thomas and Molly, are we still going? Because I don't see Samasa anymore. Sorry about this, Brian. Oh, no, no, this is, this is our new COVID reality. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, sorry about that, folks. Uh, and I'm really sad that I could not hear any of your answer. <laughs> I'm sure it was great. <laughs> um, anyway, we're, we're talking about moral, moral, morality, and I didn't say throw it out with the bathwater, but I do say like, like, like Malcolm X, when he moved from a moral economy into an ethical economy of ethical assessment, right? He was, are you hearing me now, Samasa? Yeah. Um, he was able to come to some very profound um, statements, right? One was, uh, I'm not a Democrat, nor a Republican, nor an American, and got sense enough to know it. Uh, the other was, uh, I'm a Muslim. You might be a Christian, but when you come to do Black political work, leave your religion at home in the closet, you know? And so all of those things are, he wasn't saying, uh, you know, uh, throw your moral economy out. He was saying, when we come to do the work of Black liberation, we come to think about how we suffer as Black beings, regardless of how we think about right and wrong, guilt and innocence. And that is absolutely necessary. That's what's, that, uh, you, you cannot move, you can only become a reformist of the world in which you live through the deployment and engagement with morality. You cannot become a revolutionary until you move into ethical assessment of power. And, and I, said for, I, I said I wasn't gonna talk about tactics today, but what I said was that if people are, are wondering tactically, how do I, if, if my head has been inculcated, inundated with morality, how do I move politically through ethics? And I was saying, break down, break down the speech of the person talking to you, trying to bring you into a moral economy. Break it down by analyzing what Chomsky would call four components, right? The selection of topics. Who selects the topics? What are, they, what are the topics that have been selected? What topics are not being selected? The distribution of concerns, weighting and emphasis of issues, and the, and the bounding of debate within acceptable limits. Once we're there, we can, we, can, we can break away the acceptable limits of the debate and change the entire question. Awesome, awesome. Um... So I've got several folks, um, I don't mean to be mean to you all, but some folks are asking questions about, so then what is to be done? So what do we do? What does Afro-pessimism say we should do about this or that thing, whether it's voting or different reformist policies? And the answer is Afro-pessimism does not prescribe, it's an analytic. Um, and I'd, I'd add that there are two positions. If you're black, do what you feel is right um, and try not to fall into the traps of wanting incorporation and recognition. And if you're non-black, shut up, give us your money and get out the way. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, another ensemble of questions 
Um, here we go. Dr. Wilderson, I'd like to hear you reflect on the differences between Afro-pessimism and misanthropy. I have my own sense of how they differ, but believe that the former can sometimes be mistakenly taken as a Black version of the latter. And um, along with that uh, question about the differences between Afro-pessimism and misanthropy, uh, could you also talk about the role of memoir and autobiography in your work? Because I think um, there are connections to be drawn. You know, Samasa, I'd like to hear you on the first part, because I, I, I mean, I think it's just, I, I, I believe the viewer is being sincere, but I, but I don't take the question seriously. Uh, you know what I mean? Which is not yeah. to say being insincere. In, in other words, when I say I don't take it seriously, it's not, it's not just a, a put down. It's like if the person has actually read um, the, the, the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic interventions of, of Afro-pessimism, for example, in my second book where I take uh, the, the, the psychoanalytic theorist Jacques Lacan to task, or if that person has read uh, David Marriott, or if that person has read Sidia Hartman or, or Jared Sexton, then um, they wouldn't, you, you know, it was, the question is, should be inverted, which is to say, why is, what is the genome of humanity that makes its intelligibility and its coherence anti-Black? Not what is it about Afro-pessimism that hates human beings? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, it's an upside down question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, I'll add this, Afro-pessimism actually, uh, very much so coincided with a switch in my life, which I say was the difference between me wanting to help the the Black situation and loving all Black people, you know? Um, and I, I've, I've seen this affective change in me in the way I approach questions of the, the black, black people who are outcasts, Black people who are considered mad, Black people who um, go outside the bounds of respectable discourse and movement. Um, black people just doing whatever the heck they want to do. And I don't have to understand it, even as a black person. And I don't think anyone else should either. And Afro pessimism helped me to understand that I shouldn't feel the need to understand or police, um, those expressions of being, or non-being, rather. That's very good. Yeah. Um, so we've got one question uh, from someone who, uh, Cassian Vobel, um, who asks, uh, they're struggling with um, how does genocide, historical and ongoing, of indigenous people um, all over the planet relate to uh, the ontological difference that is anti-blackness and negro phobogenesis and in particular they're thinking about aboriginal australians um, who self-identify as black fellows and um, he asked do aborigines function as black and can they be Black in Australia, but distinct from anti-Blackness in the world? Yes, I know, Cassian, and that's a 10-week question, as you yourself know. Um, we have to be careful in, in, let me do this anecdotally, um, or let me do this, I, you know, in my second book, I take great pains to write against this uh, critical theory move, which is called analogy, which is to say, how do different groups suffer in the same way? Um, but I'm going to, and I call that the ruse of analogy, and I'm, but I'm going to violate my own standards for a moment, uh, just, so I can, just so I can explain this. Um, 
You know, as, as you know, Samasa, because you've been in the Das Kapital class twice now, um, in Das Kapital, Marx is not interested essentially in what working people think about themselves. He is not interested essentially in what the working class says about themselves or how they identify. And one of the things that, so in other words, this, 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 this um, hobble that we have pedagogically by being trained in the United States or in Britain has a, goes, has a long history of pedagogy, which goes back at least to, to Matthew Arnold's book, Culture and Anarchy in 1869, in which he develops the, the British public school system. And, and it rests so much on observation and empiricism that it's almost in the DNA of intellectual and pedagogic work in England and America to trust first what people say about themselves and not fully investigate, if investigate at all, how they are positioned in a paradigm of violence and power. And so the nice thing about cont continental philosophy and, and theory in France and Germany and, and in places, other places I've been like South Africa is that the real, the real, that's not unimportant what someone says about themselves, but it is inessential to thinking the violence of state power and oppression. What, what Marx teaches us is that regardless if you are a fascist, if you are a liberal, or if you espouse communism, if you are positioned as a being from whom surplus value is extracted from your body, then what you say about yourself is secondary to how you and where you are positioned. You are positioned as a worker for the simple fact that paradigmatically you work from eight to noon and reproduce use value, but then you have to come back after lunch and work from one to five to produce surplus value. And it is that surplus value which goes somewhere else and which is parasitic on your labor time. And that is, that is the structure of suffering of the entire working class, whether or not they identify as a Ku Klux Klan member, a black shirt fascist, or Antifa, it, that, is the, that, is, that is the structure of their suffering. And so what Afro-pessimism has argued, if we, if we leave Marx, let me ask you, Samasa, do you think that that is clear so I can make, th this is how you help me in class, do you think that that is clear so that I can make the next move out of Marxism into Afro-pessimism, or do I need to say something else about that? The... I, I think it's clear, clear, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so, so, the, so the, the point is that whether if someone is positioned through indigeneity, if someone is positioned as uh, an Aztec in Mexico or Central America, if someone is positioned as an aboriginal person in Australia, if someone is positioned through indi indigeneity as a, Lakota, as a Lakota nation, that positioning comes with its laws and its technologies and its, its structure of violence and its structure of, of, of paradigmatic positioning. And that across the board, whether one calls oneself black or red or Lakota or Ohlone, it, there's a common structure to that paradigmatic position. And the common structure involves a conceptually coherent form of oppression that is based in two things, temporality and spatiality. In other words, what, like the worker who comes back to work from one to five, 
they have had extracted, they have lost, they have extracted from them the temporality of labor time. The capitalist has been parasitic on the temporality of the second half of the day so that the capitalist can produce value surplus value. And so the indigenous person has been robbed, has, been, has become the parasitic host of someone, of a formation of people who have taken their land, their spatial integrity, and has taken their speech and their culture and genocided them for, these, for, for, the, for this temporal extraction, this temporal robbery. But what am I trying to say here, ultimately, before I move to the Black? What I'm trying to say here is that this is an experience of loss. This is an experience of loss, and what has been lost or stolen is conceptually coherent. What has been lost and stolen is the land that the settler now calls Australia. What has been lost and stolen is the land that the settler now calls the United States of America. And so regardless of how the indigenous person who has been genocided identifies themselves, they suffer through the rubrics of indigeneity and its oppressive mechanisms. Samasa, help me out here. Is that clear? Can I move to the next thing? Yeah, yeah, you're good. That is not the paradigm of social death. That is, not, that is not the paradigm of social death. There is, there, is, there is no third rail, what we call in semiotics, a third term mediator. So at the bottom two points of a triangle, you've got the settler and you've got the indigenous person. And at the top point of the paradigm of, of, of the triangle, you have land and culture. And what the settler and the, the, the indigenous person can agree on, in fact, their conflict, the genocide that happens to the Native American is dependent upon both groups being coherent in their understanding of that top point of the triangle. We are fighting over land, the conceptualization, whether this will be called Turtle Island or the United States of America. We were fighting over culture, whether you will be assimilated into the paradigm of whiteness or allowed to have your indigeneity. And regardless of what happens in terms of the different experiences of those oppressions in Hawaii, the difference of those forms of oppression in Canada and British Columbia, the difference of those forms of oppression in Australia, the paradigm of suffering is the same. So they are not black. And Justice Taney, I'll end it right here, made this very clear. He, uh, in the Supreme Court in, I believe, uh, 1853, in the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court returned Dred Scott to slavery. But the 250 page majority opinion is really worth reading because at a certain point in time, lo and behold, Justice Taney gives us an Afro-pessimist analytics. <laughs> I mean, he didn't know what he was doing, okay? But, but, but he did, but he did. Because there are, some, there are some jurisprudential scholars who will wrongly say that the Supreme Court returned Dred Scott to prison, to, sorry, to, yeah, to prison, well, to slavery. And in so doing, the Supreme Court sided with the two lower courts who had said he should go back to slavery. Remember, there are three, court, there are three lower court decisions. One lower court says Dred Scott made it to Minnesota, which is a non-slave territory. Therefore, he's free. Then two lower courts said, no, Dred Scott, even in Minnesota, it doesn't matter where he made it to. He was not manumitted, he was not freed by his master. And so a cursory or superficial reading of the 250 page majority de de uh, decision of the Supreme Court will have a jurisprudential scholar thinking that the Supreme Court sided with the two lower courts. But guess what? They, it, they did not. 
Justice Taney says the following. I am returning Dred Scott to slavery. And in so doing, the majority opinion is not siding with the two lower courts because, the, because the Supreme Court's decisions are met in, in, what, in what jurisprudence is called Herculean interpretation of the law. And what he says is that the lower courts who returned him to slavery and the lower court who set him free were both wrong. Is it a paradox? It is not a paradox. And he makes the point by saying that Dred Scott and this gets back to your original question about the Black Liberation Army in, 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 in the courts. Dred Scott had no jurisprudential standing because only a subject of jurisprudence can come before the court and have it adjudicated as to whether or not he is free or innocent. Dred Scott is a speaking implement Dred Scott is a fungible and accumulated object. Dred Scott comes from a place called Africa, which is, which is void of what the Supreme Court calls political community, or we could say civil society. And as a result, all three lower courts were wrong, not because of the decision, but because they heard his case. You should never have done that because in hearing his case, you have let a non-being into the universe of humanness. And then he concludes through an anecdote by saying, the most degraded form of humanity are Native Americans, but they are still human. They have the capacity through assimilation and through proper training to actually become part of our communal existence. And he, and he actually uses a, a, a metaphor of immigration to say that they could, you know, it's, it's, it's wild because it's like he dropped a rock of colonialism down on their heads, but it, through his like phantasmagorical uh, projections, he's saying they can immigrate to the United States and, and evolve into exalted citizens if they just learn how to get with it. But there is no transformative capacity for the Black. And he's very, very keenly keeping the borders between humanness and Blackness sanctified in this statement. So Black people do not suffer through the loss of cartographic space, through the loss of temporality like the worker. We suffer through the absence of access to the question. We suffer through the absence, absence of uh, access, lack of access to the question. And that is the nature of the black human divide. And it is, it is not a form of discrimination. It is absolutely necessary to repeat this divide through rituals of what we in Afro-pessimism called gratuitous violence, meaning rituals of violence that happen to black bodies without there having been a prior transgression in order for this divide to happen. Andrew Jackson said in a campaign speech, I've never killed a recalcitrant Indian And I've never, i sorry, well, how did it go? I'm sorry, I've never met a recalcitrant, I've never met a recalcitrant Indian that I didn't kill. And I've never killed a recalcitrant Indian that I didn't scalp. And if you gentlemen in the audience are at any doubt, you are welcome to come to my parlor after this campaign speech where you can see the scalps of recalcitrant Indians lined along the mantelpiece. What is important about that statement from an Afro-pessimist point of view? It is not the massacre. It is the word recalcitrance. Recalcitrant is the contingent transgression because if the Indian was not recalcitrant, then they might find that path of assimilation. There's no opportunity for black bodies to be good or recalcitrant in order to assuage or modulate the violence. 
There's no opportunity to be good or recalcitrant because anti-Black violence is a necessary ensemble of rituals to repeat and reproduce the distinction that Justice Taney outlines as he scolds lower courts in his 250-page decision. So we're here uh, now at the end. This will be the final ensemble of questions. Um, so we've got someone who's asked about Lyndon Barrett. And so if you could talk about uh, your relation to uh, Lyndon and their work and their legacy in Black studies. Um, and then also we've got someone who uh, is essentially asking, they're talking about how tiring it can be to be out fighting for freedom when liberalism always seems to take hold of the radical demands in the streets. Um, and how does this fight uh, become personally damaging to us who want those radical visions of freedom and change? Um, and to that, I'd like to uh, make a little plug um, about Cuba, uh, which I know we both have connections to. Um, and as I'm learning more and more about Cuba, who is a country which has endured unimaginable, you know, uh, brunts of violence from the United States and the rest of the world, and yet they still keep fighting in this humanitarian way in this moment of the COVID-19 crisis, they're still sending doctors uh, all across the world especially to Africa, um, different African nations, um, doing so selfless, selflessly um, when they're you know, running short on supplies and, and um, things that they need. Um, and that uh, perhaps that type of um, sort of fight that they have in them is because that country is born of abolitionist slave revolts um, that had to be beaten back by United States occupation and later um, United States genocidal sanctions. Um, so yeah, if you could talk about Lyndon Barrett and you know the sort of revolutionary struggle and the toll it can take. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lyndon Barrett was chair, I'm chair of African American studies and he was, uh, we're a department now. And he was, a, as you know, and many other people might not know, it was a profound um, intellectual and, 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 crit and critical theorist. Uh, he's largely responsible uh, for my being here. He was chair and director uh, when, I, when I came here. And that was uh, a, a major struggle because there are people who didn't want me here. Um, and he went to bat for me. And then we went to bat. Uh, for him. I, I have quoted his, um, I think he's, I think from a black Marxist slash literary tradition, he is one of the most foremost scholars. And I, and I really, even though we don't agree at the level of assumptive logic, uh, you know, in, in terms of that, the essential, I read his, he's dead now. I read his, I read his work and I've worked through it uh, in my second book um, as um, thinking that the essential aspect of suffering is exploitation and alienation. Although his highly, highly skilled, trained reading of literature brings in a kind of black dimension to that. And so I simply, uh, I don't know if the person has read that and trying to either throw shade at me or getting trying to get me to talk about that. I don't, I don't really I don't really know. But I think that some of the most productive uh, debates and conversations are about um, what, it, what do black people suffer essentially? Is it from the Marxist tradition that you and I learned for two years in Das Kapital, exploitation and alienation, or is it social death, which I explain by way of example through um, the absence of any form of exploitation, which is that comes out of the uh, Justice Taney uh, decision. Um, but I also think that like uh, any black scholar and especially black scholars 
who are moving in a liberatory fashion, the way Lyndon Barrett did, that we suffer tremendously. And um, he is on record as um, talking about, for years, the ways in which he was persecuted uh, in the English department here. So um, because people like Lyndon Barrett and Fred Moten and Sadia Hartman um, really suffered in the academy and kept going in the 1990s, you know, even though I'm, I'm probably older than all of them, I came along because I've been such a vagabond in the world, you know, <laughs> I came along after them. And um, sadly enough, it's uh, their blood, metaphorically, but in Lyndon's case, literally, because he ultimately, um, you know, died, um, which paved the way for my presence, uh, just as um, any time any of us who are Black get anywhere, it's because a bunch of Black people have just been murdered in the immediate temporal context. Uh, there's no movement on the ground right now because people are listening to Black people. There's movement on the ground because they've killed a number of us in, in succession and they're afraid of what we're gonna do. That's not a conversation. That's not an engagement. That's, that's getting back to Obama's flipping from thugs in 2014 to I celebrate you here. One time he's a cop, next time he's a co-opter. So um, Lyndon Barrett is one of those people who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And um, yeah, what was he, so what was the other one? Can't hear you. Yeah, so um, if we can just end with your thoughts on revolutionary struggle and the sort of toll that it takes. And um, I mentioned the plight of Cuba um, and talked about their history of uh, being a, a country born of abolitionist slave revolts, uh, a country that's very much so tied to Africa and the African continent, um, both through spirituality and through material, um, you know, uh, help and resources um, as sort of a, a big example of a country and a people uh, engaged in this long struggle and the sort of damage it can do um, and I guess if you could speak on that, perhaps uh, personally, um, I know getting, uh, I was gonna say getting out of South Africa, but it would be more accurate to say you were tossed out of South Africa. <laughs> um, and, and what that took on you. Yeah, I mean, there's a way in which I always say that um, um, I hate all nation states. Um, but if I had to choose one nation state to love, it would be Cuba. Um, I, I lived there. I didn't live there. I visited there for six weeks. And uh, in 1998, and what I, what I found was, was uh, the resilience and the resolve of the Cuban people to be oriented towards the revolutionary struggles of people everywhere, especially people of color and, and, and African people. That was, that, was the, that was the good side. I lived in South Africa very shortly after the Battle of Quito Carnival, which is the battle in which 10,000 Cuban troops came to the aid of the Angolan revolutionaries. And for the first time in history, an army drove the South African armies back into South Africa. The white South African army had never been defeated before. And, 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 and you talk about what that did to the revolutionary psyche. I think the Battle of Quito Carnival happened in something like 1988. Uh, and I rock up in 1989. And what you see is a kind of energistic resurgence of revolutionary zeal of black people on the ground in in South Africa, because 
the white soldiers have come back, not victorious, but with their tails between their legs. And I taught a, a, a graduate seminar um, it, at the University of Vatersvan, which was a white place where some of the people had been, you know, because every white person had to go to the army. And I could actually see defeat in the eyes of some of these white guys, defeat in the eyes, defeat by what in Afrikaans is called the Svat, svat Gavar, which means the black threat in, in Afrikaans. And so it was, it was um, Fidel Castro's, uh, you know, even when the Soviet Union, his parent, like your parents, the UAW, even when the Soviet Union says, don't be an interventionist, don't be adventure, uh, uh, an adventurous, you know, he would say, no, there are people who call in us and need our help. Boom, we hit set, we drove the Boers back across the border, and now they have a bunch of white kids in college refusing the draft, talking about negotiations, wanting to end apartheid, not because they're wonderful, loving people, but because they got their ass kicked, okay? That was, that was a really important thing. Um, the Cuban doctors, when we were trying to reorganize the entire political economy of the country that we were about to take over, and we were saying that we were going to go into the hospitals and the medical schools of the University of Cape Town, the University of Witzwaterstrand, and transform the orientation of those medical schools from uh, high-end uh, operations like open heart surgery and plastic surgery and all the things that these medical schools were, were, were aimed at rich people and try to uh, revamp the entire medical industry towards preventive medicine. It was the Cuban doctors who were giving us blueprints for this new dispensation. It never happened because um, the so-called ultra left, like people like me, Mandela put me on a, on a hit list. Uh, to be a so-called ultra leftist, to be neutralized. But in other words, we were able to see in Cuba, and then, the, and then years later, I saw for myself in Cuba, how medicine that doesn't cost money, how medicine that is not about high-end surgeries, how medicine that does not have a firewall between conventional practice and alternative integrative medicine, how that can make a people, a whole island of people healthy. And when you jump across to other islands like Trinidad, where I spent three months, you see the fruits of colonialism with respect to no access to medical care, medical care being um, for the rich, medical care not being integrated with alternative practices and medical care not being about prevention. So those are the good things. The other good thing is that, um, as you know, in, you, because you are part uh, Southern Baptist and part uh, Benin Vudan, uh, I too am a practitioner of Vudan. I'm not a Christian or a Muslim or, or a Judeo person. I, and my, my Baba Lao, uh, Samasa, tell the audience, what is a Baba Lao? Uh, Baba Lao is a sort of spiritual uh, uh, guide, practitioner, knowledgeable person who uh, often takes on that position of uh, being the one, the go-between uh, between us lay folk or lay practitioners of Ifa and those who have been initiated um, into uh, the, the sort of spiritual sphere that that. I don't want to say religion, but um, of Ifa, um, and you should all uh, look into that more if you want to. Thank you. My Babo Lao is is a Cuban spiritual leader. Um, he comes from a long tradition of Vudan, or some would say Voodoo practitioners that draw his line from Cuba back to Angola. Um, I actually saw his name on here. So, so I mean, in other words, uh, if you, I, I have studied Radha, which is a, a form of voodoo in Trinidad, and I have contacted with it in Cuba. But in Cuba, it is in its, Cuba and Haiti are the place where it's in some of its most pure uh, 
unadulterated states. And so um, I have benefited spiritually and in my life from the ways in which uh, this person who is a Cuban Babalao has connected me with the Orishas and I consult him anytime I'm gonna make a major move or just live, right? So those are the positive things. I will say that even in Cuba, however, there is still anti-Blackness. It has been legislated away because it is illegal to express it, but that is in the realm of what we call secondary processes of signification. Secondary processes of signification are how the psyche work in the, re in the, in the topography, the topos of the preconscious and the conscious. But the unconscious mind, which, which, which trades on tenacious fixation, identification, desire, aggressivity, and not on logic. The unconscious mind in Cuba collectively is still overdetermined by anti-blackness the way the unconscious mind is throughout the Western hemisphere and, and, the, and the rest of the world. It's just easier to live there as a black person because it is illegal to express. That doesn't, all, that doesn't mean that's gonna be there forever, but those are some of the, the high points of what I would say about Cuba and its relationship to me personally, its relationship to Africa and its struggles, its relationship to medicine, its relationship to the continuity of our spirituality. Couldn't think of a better place to end. Uh, thank you all for sticking through this. I know it was long. Um, hope you enjoyed it, got some out of it. And I really wanted this to be something that people can return to as well. Um, so shout out to the folks who organized this, the FU Pay Us <laughs> um, Collective. Um, and yeah, um, wishing you all love and rejuvenation uh, as we all struggle for a better world or rather, to end the world. One more thing. Uh, People should really understand, you all didn't talk about your suffering. And I would like to challenge the COLA, the, the, I would like to acknowledge the suffering of, of the COLA activists who are TAs, uh, uh, because uh, it is really criminal the way that the, use, the UFC system treats you. It was criminal the way that, that they treated us 21 years ago. Uh, I live in Orange County, you live in Orange County, most of the people who organize this are on the UC campus, but this is going to campuses all over, and if you take campuses like UC Irvine and Santa Barbara, the cost, let me just put it to the audience like this, the poverty line in Orange County is $80,000 a year, that was about seven years ago, it must be higher now. What you guys put in your pocket is about $24,000 a year. And so um, this, is, this is wrong. Uh, we have lost a lot of great candidates. I sit on admissions committees for graduate programs, uh, especially culture and theory. We've lost a lot of great candidates who go to places like Princeton and uh, Northwestern, even people in Stanford, people wanna come and study with the Afro-pessimists here, just figure they just can't do it. Because if we're getting a $24,000 at the end of the day to live in a place that's $80,000 is the poverty line. That's what it means to be poor in Orange County. And I'm going to Northwestern or Princeton, they're offering me 10,000 to $12,000 more than you. Why would I come here even for this great education? So we've got to do better. Um, as a university system. Uh, and then you all got to do better with respect to Black undergraduates str struggling. You've really got to, I, I'm, not putting, I'm not putting you on blast, uh, but um, I, I'm making a challenge to the COLA activists to not to instrumentalize Black suffering, but to listen to the demands of the BSU and get down with that. And with that, thank you all. Bye-bye.